On that note, allow me to turn it over to our speaker for the evening. The king of Kubernetes, the oligarch of operators, the frontier privateer kicking your server in the rear, Adam Sander. Woo! <laughs> wow. That was something. OK. Hi, everyone. The emperor of Kubernetes speaking, apparently. So yeah, let me just fix this here. OK. Um, I work as a. Uh, Kubernetes cloud slash DevOps consultant for container solutions in Amsterdam. I was working with uh, Euralf. Euralf was my client at some point, and uh, we uh, moved him to the cloud. He's floating there ever since um, when he was working in VR Online. And today I'm going to talk to you about Kubernetes operators. It is a more advanced topic in Kubernetes land, and I'm thinking probably not everybody here is a somebody who would be working with Kubernetes every day. So let's do a bit of a show of hands so I get a bit feel for the audience. Who is working day to day with Kubernetes? Yes, OK. Docker? Good. That's going to be very helpful for the, for the talk. Who is doing some kind of infrastructure provisioning with Ansible, Terraform, any of these? All right, so most people are then um, familiar with the, with the problem of, of provisioning infrastructure. <coughs> so before we dive into, into why Kubernetes operators are amazing and the future and Terraform and Ansible and anything of this will not exist next year, um, let's take a look at different ways you can do infra provisioning. The most old school and also the experiment, exploratory, experimental way that you will use when you, let's say, use a new cloud provider or first time uh, sit down in front of Kubernetes will be you grab either some CLI or go to some UI and create some resources there. Right? That's, uh, there is you, the operator. There is a tool that uh, where you perform just basically commands, create this, create that. There is the API of the cloud. So the great thing about clouds is that they have APIs, right? So we can uh, still, even with the UI and CLI, we can still uh, kind of programmatically provision resources, whether it's a DNS entry, a web server, a load balancer, whatever things we want to create in the cloud like AWS or Google Cloud or whatever. So the, the downside of this approach is, upside is it's the most simple way, very direct. I just go click, 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 new VM, thank you. The downside of it is that I don't have any record of things I have created. I don't have reproducibility. Next time I want to create the same thing, I'll go again, either do a lot of typing or, uh, or do a lot of clicking on the UI, probably not even remembering what I did the first time. So this is good for exploration, not great for setting up production systems. Second is using something like Terraform or Ansible in between. So in this case, because Terraform and Ansible take some kind of text description of the environment that you want to create, you can put all that into Git. You can set up a Jenkins server or something that fires off a job when uh, when your Git repo changes, when your Terraform or Ansible files or Puppet files, whatever changes in Git. And Terraform will talk to this cloud API behind the scenes and provision the resources for you. And some of these tools like Puppet and Ansible are semi-declarative. It's a very important concept. Whether the input you're giving this tool is a bunch of commands, do this, do that, or is it a description of the whole environment that you want to create? In case of Terraform, it's going to be a declarative description of the environment, which is very important because if it's commands, then uh, you, for example, you, you, your command might fail because some resource already exists. But Terraform just takes input. I want to have this resource. I want to have a load balancer in my cloud and its job and, you, you, and, it, and Terraform's job is to figure out, does that load balancer already exist? Maybe yes, but with different configurations. So I have to update it. I have to create it. Maybe it exists, but it's not in the current configuration. So I have to delete it. So this is the idea of Terraform and Ansible and these tools. Um, 
The downside of these tools is that their language is very verbose. They are not great at abstractions. Either you have to write your own plugin for them that takes a whole different input, which is quite uh, involved to work with them that way, or, uh, or basically you will end up with a really large Terraform configuration where you're configuring every little aspect of that load balancer. So when you are a developer and you're used to working with programming languages, there you can abstract everything because you just choose your inputs, do something in your code, and then something comes out. You can do whatever in your code. But with Terraform, you can't do whatever. You can only do what Terraform allows you to do. But it's still great. Um, the other problem with this is that it kind of expects manual input. So a lot of times, this whole process, you change the Git repo, goes nicely. But a lot of times, this, for the smallest reasons, Terraform and Zibble can just crap out there. They are not really designed to handle any kind of situation because it's very hard to handle any kind of situation. So you will never have a tool that just does everything magically always. But still, these tools were designed kind that you will run them from the command line and then they will ask you, is it okay if I do all these things? Yeah, it's okay. And then they say, oh, but I managed to do 98%, but like these two things I didn't manage, please fix it. So these tools, a lot of times involve, very, it's very hard to have a fully automated process with, uh, with these tools. They also, don't, they also don't, like, don't monitor the environment, right? So they do something when the Git repo changes and that's it. Even if they succeed, it's over. If your web server disappears for some reason or your load balancer or whatever, Terraform will not notice that unless you change the Git repo, fire off the process again, and then it might actually fix the problem. So that's how we get to a, another way of doing things. And this is the way how Kubernetes manages resources. At this point, we have gone from managing any kind of resource in any cloud, which Terraform does with lots of plugins for all kinds of cloud environments and whatever, to just doing things on top of Kubernetes for a moment. So how Kubernetes manages resources, it kind of does away. You don't need Terraform or anything for Kubernetes. It has its own language, which is, of course, YAML file, because that's fashionable to have everything in YAML files. And what Kubernetes does. First of all, this is a sample input that you give to Kubernetes. It's fully declarative. You never do commands. You never say to Kubernetes, uh, create this or, or do, okay, you do sometimes, but generally your process is fully declarative. You can, you can just say that there, this deployment will run an Nginx server. Basically, this is the important part here. It will run an Nginx image of version 179, will expose container port 80, la di la. A lot of YAML for just that thing, but yeah, it's all right. You have to be settled, you have to be able to set all those other things. And if you ever change something in this YAML, you will just tell Kubernetes, look, new YAML. You don't tell it to, I'm updating this now, or I'm creating this now, or I'm changing something in there now. You just tell Kubernetes, new YAML, figure it out what needs to be changed now. And Kubernetes will, first of all, when you create this, this is a deployment with three replicas. So Kubernetes will spin up three Nginx containers on your servers because at this point we are in Kubernetes land and Kubernetes is managing all your servers. There is no Ansible, no Terraform. We stepped away from that and Kubernetes will create three pods, which is pretty much container in Kubernetes land. Uh, similar enough for those who would like to raise their hands. No, it's not. It is. Um, so first of all, it will create those three pods. But what it will also, and it will allow you to just update this YAML, let's say, say set replicas to one or set a different Nginx image. That's the more interesting one. For example, you set a different Nginx image and it will start a rolling upgrade of those pods, it will kill one, start up one. If that succeeded, it will kill the second one, start up one, kill the third one, start up one. Here we are getting to the whole intelligence of this, of, uh, of the deployment controller here in the middle. So it's not just meant to just dumbly 
create a few resources. Because you could tell Kubernetes, I want three pods. You don't need this deployment for that. Uh, and the, the deployment controller will also, what, what it does is make sure that the real world on the right side matches the uh, specification basically on the left side. And it does that all the time, whatever happens. Either the spec changes or the real world might change. For example, a pod might die. A whole server might blow up that kills two of the three pods. Kubernetes notices this. This controller is constantly monitoring what's happening and will start up two new pods. It will even kill a pod if you would start up a fourth pod it will say, no, fourth po four pods, no, I'm supposed to have three, kill one. It will constantly be monitoring what's happening in the real world and make sure it matches what you want the world to look like. Of course, it's not magic. Sometimes this breaks down this process, but actually works really, really well and makes running applications on Kubernetes pretty resilient. You just have to add a little bit of sugar to this to make sure those Nginx pods actually return some kind of health check endpoint, an HTTP endpoint for health checks. And you have a super resilient system where Kubernetes constantly monitors those health checks. If the container becomes unhealthy, it will immediately kill it, start up a new one, and it just works pretty beautifully. A, another example, in which case we are provisioning resources not on Kubernetes but using the same principle. So the tricky thing about Kubernetes is it manages its own internal network. When your Docker containers run on top of Kubernetes, underneath there are servers and there is networking and these containers can talk to each other. That's all we need to know about Kubernetes for, for this. It's, a, it's like a cloud where your application containers run, they talk to each other, they basically f perform their functionality. Ingress is a thing, how does traffic get into the cluster? That's a, that's a problem because pretty much depending on your infrastructure that is around Kubernetes, this might change. If you're on Google Cloud, for example, there are different types of load balancers and different things. And what you might do is just use Terraform to provision those things, to route the traffic into the Kubernetes cluster and then Kubernetes takes care of the rest. But a very interesting pattern that the Kubernetes guys came up with and practically Google came up with first on their cloud was uh, we can just provide an abstract object called the ingress that you create on Kubernetes and then there will be an implementation, a special GCP ingress controller, not just that generic ingress controller, but a special GCP ingress controller, Google Cloud Platform, GCP, um, it's like AWS which will actually create the load balancer and, actually, and some other routing rules inside Google Cloud. So outside of the Kubernetes cluster. So at this moment, you're practically managing your cloud environment that is around Kubernetes with a Kubernetes object, with creating things as if inside Kubernetes, but actually they will not be inside because this controller is implemented in a way that it talks to the Google Cloud APIs and creates load balancers and stuff on the Google Cloud, not inside the Kubernetes uh, cluster. So this is a, and actually there is no big magic to this. Why not, practically? It's an interesting pattern, but there is no reason they could not write this because this controller has some code in it. That code can talk to an API. It makes this stuff happen. It's great because you're already working on Kubernetes, so you like this way of, uh, okay, I don't have to go out to Google Cloud, use another technology to provision a one stupid load balancer. I don't need to switch to Terraform for that. I can just create this ingress and things outside my cluster get spun up. And also, of course, there goes the whole monitoring. If the load balancer would get deleted, it will recreate it. All that stuff is, is still happening. So controllers can create things outside of Kubernetes also. They can, they don't, they're not limited to managing things inside Kubernetes. Now, if we take this a step further, on the left side until now, we've always used some kind of uh, Kubernetes object that we just basically, this, this object will live in Kubernetes in the same way as it looks like in the YAML file with all these properties. It's part of networking Kubernetes IO, it's kind ingress. 
Um, so a whole Kubernetes works on these kind of objects. You create objects in their API that get stored in a database, and then the controllers are acting on those objects that are in the API to actually manage real things. You can also define your own object types. So here we get to the, to the actual, the, the, this operator pattern that I'm going to be talking about. So you don't need to limit yourself to whatever Kubernetes offers out of the box. You can just dump whatever data practically in the Kubernetes API server. You define a schema for it. And then I, can, I came up with my own little thing called a web server. I can register this with the Kubernetes API server. I can put this object in there and nothing will happen at all. Kubernetes allows me to put the data in there, but it doesn't know what to do with it at all. However, I can run and write an operator that will do the same thing as the internal Kubernetes controllers here, and will monitor these objects in the Kubernetes API server, and then do things based on that. In my example, I will be creating Kubernetes objects inside Kubernetes based on this web server. So I practically implement a uh, web server that will that you put the HTML inside this object and it will spin up an nginx server on top of Kubernetes with some extra objects like an ingress and the config map and things you don't need to know what exactly but but basically the Java code will will in showing it's it's written in Java here inside this makes this happen that's the important part so the and then can again do the monitoring, do, do smart things, because this is continuously running code, not just a one-off process where I shoot off Terraform and uh, okay, it happened, didn't happen, whatever is done. So basically the whole idea why we call these operators, there is a bit of confusion what is a controller and an operator, basically just it's kind of the same thing. The, this <coughs> operator pattern was invented originally for managing the Kubernetes core object. So Joe Beda, one of the inventors of Kubernetes, uh, is, has his background in control theory, which is about monitoring systems where you are getting a feedback loop and constantly having to act on a feedback loop. For example, a robot balancing on one leg and then the feedback is the current position and then you have to constantly like uh, manage the, the program always have to, has to act, act like, okay, it's turning right and I'm a bit uh, shifting left and these kind of things. And that's how they did the internal Kubernetes stuff. And then guys from CoreOS realized that, oh, we can use this to do better infrastructure automation for any kind of stuff, basically. And the idea why we call them operators is because even with Terraform, there's always an operator who needs to manage especially more complex things like databases, for example, where you cannot just like upgrade it by replacing a Docker image, but there is maybe an upgrade process that needs to happen. And because these operators are just code inside them, I will be showing it in a minute in a small demo, um, they can just do whatever. That doesn't make it easy, by the way. Um, you'll still need to write all the code. So what, what, is, what, does, what this gives you is that, uh, that it gives you a little framework that use the Kubernetes API server to store your data to store your, input, store your inputs, run, the, run your code as a pod on Kubernetes, store your status back into the API server, and then, yeah, do your thing, basically. This is the pattern. It doesn't sound like much, but in practice, it is very powerful. Because you're not picking databases anymore. You're not managing databases because the Kubernetes API server, if you're in a Kubernetes environment, that's just there. You don't care about it. And also, Kubernetes will make, make sure that this code in that operator always runs. So again, you don't worry about operating the operator. So you get not that much. It's not like a, a silver bullet technology that you just apply and now suddenly everything is amazing. But it gives you a nice framework on how to do this kind of smart uh, management. And you can do this for your own application. If you have a complex application where every upgrade, for example, needs a database migration, needs all kinds of complex things to happen, and you never knew where to stick that logic in, an operator might just be the, the right thing to use. Because Terraform, for example, doesn't really have, it can like run some script on some server, but 
that's, that's not great. This is uh, much more powerful. So if we look at, back at this picture, how the demo will, uh, will work. OK, I will just straight jump to the demo picture. So what will happen in the demo, so you get an understanding of that, because there's one confusing aspect is that we will be creating things on Kubernetes, which creating things on Kubernetes means putting some Kubernetes objects into the Kubernetes API server. So our operator is talking to the Kubernetes API server. But the input for the operator is also in the Kubernetes API server. So these two boxes are logically separate, but they're actually the same Kubernetes API server. And this wouldn't need to be the Kubernetes API server. Just for my demo, it's easier if I just do everything on Kubernetes and not, uh, not start spinning up things on Google Cloud, because then the Wi-Fi fails and whatever, and it just all crashes and burns. So that's just so you understand that. Uh, and the operator itself is actually also running here inside this cluster. So everything <laughs> is happening in that cluster. Inception. Yeah, well, that's, but that's exactly the same thing as with what, what happens with like this. Like uh, the deployment controller is part of Kubernetes. It kind of runs on Kubernetes, and then it creates other things on Kubernetes. It's not, a, not a, actually not a very uh, uh, interesting thing. Oh, yeah. And one other uh, thing I didn't mention, there are frameworks for implementing operators. Because what you need to do basically in an operator, you need to watch your objects that you put into the Kubernetes API server, so any events. New one is created, something is updated, and so on. You need to watch any changes. And then you need to execute, and you need to write back, for example, a status into this object. And it's nice to wrap that little logic in a, in a framework. And there is two frameworks I would mention. One is the operator SDK, which is written in Go. So you can use it only with Go. They somehow say they support Ansible also. So somehow you can make also like Ansible, but combine it with like this continuously running loop. I have no idea how they do that, but I can kind of imagine. But um, that's the big one. And then there is ours, which has been started a few months ago to make this possible with Java. So um, don't want to go very deep. I, my example will be with the Java operator SDK because I'm a Java guy. But basically, all the operators that are out there, for example, there is a MySQL operator. There is actually quite a lot. There is a Kafka operator. There's a lot of these operators ready-made that you can use to run things on top of Kubernetes, which is great. Like you can just create like a topic in the Kubernetes API server and then it creates a Kafka server and like with your topic and everything. So it's, uh, it's really amazing. Those are completely fine to be all, they're all written in Go, nobody does Java in there, which is completely fine. But if you want to be, if you're like working in a company that is a Java shop and want to be, want to build custom provisioning for your own application, want to build an operator that somewhat, that manages the upgrade process and the whatnot, then yeah, doing it in Java might be a very good choice because learning Go just for that is uh, maybe not great. OK, so um, demo time. OK, let's just, let's just do things on the command line. Oops. Yes, there we go. OK, so at this point, my operator is running on top of Kubernetes. Um, I get pods in this namespace. Here is the web server operator, and we'll be monitoring the logs of this operator. It already did some things, never mind that. And I will create a new namespace on Kubernetes. Namespaces on Kubernetes are like kind of like projects. They separate things so you don't get name clashes and whatever. So I create a namespace called DOM code. And in that namespace, I will create the following web server. Here is the YAML file that defines my web server. You can see that even though I will be creating quite a few slightly complicated Kubernetes objects, here we actually have abstraction. 
So here I'm not specifying all those objects, here I'm only specifying what I need. And the only thing I need to know is what, the name, what is the name of this thing and what is the HTML that uh, we're going to be putting into that Nginx server. Actually, it's going to be an Nginx server in the background. So I do Kubernetes apply slash webserver.yaml into the namespace DOM code. And at this point, oh, I forgot to follow the logs. Yes, so it says executing create or update resource for hello web service in DOM code namespace, creating or updating a config map and creating or updating a deployment. And also, yeah, before we got there, it's already created a service uh, in DOM code config map. Oh yeah, um, you do get these events multiple times. So that's why it's, I was also confused. So it, it already happened here and then we are getting events again because Kubernetes. In the end, it doesn't matter because your operator has to handle any amounts of events on these objects. So it's, uh, it doesn't matter if it works. So I should now be able to get, so I have created a deployment, which in turn has created, should have created a pod, also a service and a config map in the DOM code namespace. Is this visible, by the way? I can enlarge the font. Yeah, this is good. No, web server. Yeah, I want to type service here. Yes. So all these things were created by the operator on the response of me creating that web server object in the API. I can also grab that web server. You don't need to really understand what each of them does. It's just that I created this one thing called the web server and all the rest was actually created by the operator. And this operator is still running and could be actually doing some management on them, which it doesn't because there is nothing really to do, except when I change the HTML code. I will show that in a minute, but let's first take a look I think if everything works, then if I now do kubectl get web server, uh, hello web server, then you can see here is my web server object with the HTML I created, and there is some status information. Yes, and what I wanted is to grab the URL so I can just go to that URL, but apparently that's broken again, but I can just get that from the, from the service actually. So it's actually this port on my local host that will be serving the... So we're at the front-end development company and any front-enders, please close your eyes. <laughs> Woohoo! HTML code. <laughs> you see, this is what uh, DevOps people do. <laughs> make, make, make this HTML with like a thousand lines of code. Uh, <laughs> so, I can go edit my object. So I go to this web server YAML and say hello DOM code. And now I do a. Sorry? Can the console already says hello DOM code? That's weird. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good catch, okay. I forgot to specify the namespace here, so I wasn't showing the actual object. Yes. <laughs> that one is running on another port. <laughs> Maybe I should just kill it. Um, okay, let's, let's write DOM code twice here, so we're sure that we're on the right name. Not, not checking my backup thing, that would be if something breaks, then I would be showing the backup. Um, okay, and I just do Kubernetes apply web server.yaml. So again, I'm just applying this. I don't, I'm not saying what changed. Just applying. What, where? Oh, yes. <laughs> Namespace, yes. Thank you. Yay. 
Now the other is showing DOM code, DOM code, because I applied it to the other one too. But. <laughs> um, okay, so to, where are we? Um, about 40 minutes in, so I'll be wrapping up slowly. I think maybe we will skip the, skip the code or just like show you a very, very quick. Uh, you started late, so you got a little extra time. Just tell me when I should like stop, shout at me like, <laughs> boring, yeah. So the, the most important piece of code in this uh, controller is the create or update resource method. Um, so this is wrapped by that Java operator SDK framework. So you don't have to deal with like Kubernetes events and whatever here. So a few things we fix and hide. You get the web server object, which basically has all the things in it that uh, we have seen already. So the spec is the most important, we get the HTML in the spec. And in the controller, we start creating things. So first of all, we determine what the current namespace is based on the namespace of the object that we are creating. And then we create a config map which will store the HTML. In Kubernetes, you can store data in a config map and then mount it as a file into a container. So what we do is, so the result of what we created here is, see, uh, oops, it, uh, get config. I will actually switch to the other namespace so I don't have to type that in always. Let's config my project. So here, so we have the, I actually converted that HTML into a config map which will then be mounted into the pod of the Nginx server into the right directory, and then it will actually serve up this HTML. It's Kubernetes stuff, if you don't really get it, it's not that interesting. The important thing is that we are get, grabbing that input, that web server input, and creating things based on it in the real world, which in our case is also Kubernetes. Um, so we create the, the config map, with the data, the data is actually index HTML. Under the name index HTML, we get the HTML from the web server object. So then we create a deployment that will start up the pods with all the rights. So here we are, for example, setting the volumes to use the config maps name to reference the config map. So there is actually a volume inside the container with the config maps data. We create a service which will handle the port mapping to my laptop. And then we also do some logic. If the config map already existed, and this is where the smarts come in, uh, if the config map already existed and the data, I'm checking here if the data actually equals, so if it doesn't equal, so if the, if the data in the config map actually changed, then I find the pod that the, the Nginx pod based on a label that is set on it. So this is, I'm using the Kubernetes client library here, which is, there is a nice one for Java called the fabricate library. So I'm getting the Kubernetes client, using the Kubernetes client, getting all the pods in a namespace with the label where app equals my deployment name because that's just how it is. And I delete the pod to make sure that the new HTML get, gets applied. So basically I restart Nginx to, uh, to get the new HTML working in a new pod. Um, and in here, I'm actually depending also on the deployment controller. So here actually kind of two operators are collaborating because I'm not creating pods from my operator. I'm just creating a deployment and then I'm deleting a pod that the deployment created and I'm assuming it will recreate it, which it does. So in, uh, in Kubernetes, if I'm now, let's say I can do a watch kubectl get pods. Ah, okay, here I actually have to type kubectl. So here is uh, my pod. And if I do kubectl, I should probably sp split this somehow. Yeah, horizontally. Yes, split. Yes, there, okay. And I type kubectl delete pod, hello web service. Bam, the next one is already creating. <laughs> so it just like immediately recreates it when it sees that the like reality doesn't match the specification basically. 
Okay, and so, so I kill the pod and assume that the deployment will be created. I could also manage the pods myself here and not use a deployment. So maybe actually for this example, if I want to make it more elaborate a bit, then I would actually do that. And then here I'm setting the status, and as you can see, I'm not setting the URL, so that's why the URL was empty. I remember I was trying to set that and something was wrong, so. And then there is a second method, which is delete resource. So if this web server gets deleted, what do I do then? And I need to clean up all the resources that I have created. And then I'm going over all the resources that I know I have created. So if I do create, uh, delete web server, hello web server, then if I go back to that, that command that was listing everything, Mm, anyways, yopctl get deployment service config map. Oh, all gone. So this is also managed by the by the operator. What's interesting here is this operator will not recreate anything if I would like. It will not really do the full reconciliation. It's, it's called the reconciliation loop. Yeah, that that loop, and I like that word. Um, so. That I would still have to write into it. So that is the thing with the operators. Just one sec for the, yeah? Can operators deploy other operators? Of course. <laughs> Can you generate an operator to uh, have an operator that will generate other operators um, to you, do more deployments? Do, you probably can, but I'm not sure there is any point to that. <laughs> But what you can do is have operators collaborating, creating like I'm collaborating with the deployment controller. And uh, yeah. So I have like a more complex example on my slides, but I don't think we'll go into that. It's, uh, it would be a bit too much. Um, so yeah, no, I don't think like generating opera operators, managing up other operators, it's like a bit too much inception, I think. But who knows, maybe there is a good case to do that. Uh, maybe in 10 years, that's all we will be writing, nothing else. Uh. <laughs> okay, um, I think I'm, 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 uh, I'm done. So if you have any more questions, I'll just go here. So you got, uh, this is the thing that we are implementing now, but it's, uh, I had to go a bit slower now, and it's, it's, it's basically writing like, breaking down one thing into many different custom resources, like we have a team that needs a CI CD system, and then the team operator, and I'm showing it anyway, um, so you just, the user just creates a team, and then the team operator will actually create a whole bunch of other objects that the team needs, with like Jenkins, deployment pipelines, uh, Bitbucket repos, all kinds of things, and then there are other operators that are actually making those things happen in the real world. So like this is like a really like far-fetched uh, thing we are doing there. We are, we are trying kind of microservice architecture, but with operators. Yes. This does not exist. Yes. No. Making? This is we are making this right now. Yes. Yeah, okay. And it's not going to be a generic thing. So this is what is an interesting use case for operators. So um, there are those generic operators like MySQL, Kafka, whatever, where you just hand it out to the world basically. If you want to run your Kafka on Kubernetes, you can use this operator. Um, but what we're doing with operators is more internal infrastructure provisioning. So we don't try to make this usable for other people. This is, there is a CI CD system, we need it to be provisioned and we just happen to do it with operators instead of Terraform. If you start deploying your private cloud? Yes, it's kind of heading that way, yeah. <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. We have an internal operator that simply uh, looks at GitLab and uh, sees if a deploy token is going to expire, creates a new deploy token, and puts it back into uh, Kubernetes so that the images can be pulled. Yep, for example, yeah. Very different levels. How, how do you determine which, like, where to put the line, basically? I think it's the exact same thing as with, like, designing services, like, you can put more logic into one service, but you can go the microservice route, which is pretty much this. So we had a big debate whether all this logic goes into the team operator, just grabs the team, doesn't create any resources here, and just goes create straight everything that is the real stuff that needs to be created. 
or whether we do this breakdown of things and then more operators so that we can like have a nice neat Jenkins operator that only provisions the Jenkins and there is not this huge big ass process in the, in the team operator that does millions of things. This is harder, but more maintainable in the long run, we hope. And probably more fun to build also. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes? To provision what? Sorry. Yes. Yes. So actually, those operators that are out there in the wild, that people are building for these general purposes, they kind of compete with Helm. Um, because they are, instead of Helm, you will deploy Kafka with uh, with the operator rather than than using. Yeah. Yes. Then you install the operators with Helm, but yes. then the <laughs> <laughs> like I had to also for this cluster that in this demo I had to start up the operator. So there is actually a deployment that runs the operator itself. So it's uh, because it's all in Kubernetes. So. Yeah. Yeah. So quick recap: robust and flexible way to do infrastructure provisioning. But it's difficult, so we learned that that it's uh, it's it's not easy. Uh, you have to write a lot of code, and then you've written a lot of code. You realize it's still not doing all the things that you kind of want it to do because you can do cool things with the operators that you can never do with Terraform, but actually you have to write that code. Um, so you can a lot of people are using mainstream uh, operators. One say mainstream operator usage is mostly provisioning stateful resources on Kubernetes. Less mainstream that I want to push as an idea is is this kind of thing. So complex uh, system provisioning. Yeah. Thank you, and we can ask more questions. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. We deleted a few production namespaces, and uh, since then we are writing integration tests more carefully. <laughs> but the nice thing about the operators is actually that it's Java code, so you can test it. So it's uh, we we are learning that that that's also kind of nice. It's it's much easier to write it, to write tests where you have a test framework and you can like do things in memory and stuff. Any other? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. If I understand correctly, the operator is monitoring some configuration and then it runs some code to sync to real world with that? Yep. Uh, what is the advantage of putting that configuration in Kubernetes API instead of? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Yeah, so why, why would we use the Kubernetes API instead of some random database? Um, but the main reason is that Kubernetes can both store your data and run your operator. It's a nice combination. So, uh, you know, your operator, you don't have to worry about where you run your operator, and you don't have to worry about where to store your data. But you can yeah. still run your operator on Kubernetes and have it store its data elsewhere. Right? Yes, you could. Then it's not really the operator pattern anymore, but of course, you would still be doing something similar if you would store your data elsewhere. You could totally do that. But the, the Kubernetes API server is really good. It's really good for like this kind of this kind of data storage, throwing events at you when when the data has changed. Um, also, you most of the time with operators, you will be provisioning things that the like actual human operators might be interested in, and then they can just go like I can go now and say, uh, kubectl get web server. Uh, on all namespaces and I can like see all the web servers that have been provisioned and I can then you know get their statuses and stuff uh, and I can see like oh are we good yes whatever stuff I want to put in there I can like so it's a uh, so it will be very natural for people who are already managing the Kubernetes cluster to you know work with these things it's kind of the same principle as with that ingress in the Google Cloud. You could create all the HTML, all the load balancer stuff yourself without using ingress in Kubernetes. But once you're already on Kubernetes, it just becomes very convenient to do these things this way. 
Yes? To what extent is, 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 are the operators themselves bought or services which are run with Yes, 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 they are. And that's why, so something that is running on Kubernetes can talk to the Kubernetes API the same way as I'm doing things with the, the command line tool now. They are talking to the exact same API, fetching the same objects, updating them, and so on. Yes? <laughs> uh, are there things you're running into which you can do in Go, which you, can't, which you cannot do in Java? No. It's a... Um, no, because, like... Um, you, what, the only thing you might run into would be that the Go SDK does something nicer than we do. For example, it does caching. We don't do caching, so certain operations might be less efficient in the Java. And ours is very, we just starting with this. So it's, uh, but on the other hand, the Go SDK, we're, we're looking at it and exposes a lot of details to you as the user that you don't really need to know. And it's probably because they just started way sooner and now it's a bit legacy-ish uh, stuff there because they're really exposing things to you that I have no idea why would they not just hide away in the framework. Yes, that's the problem with Go, as soon as you expose something you um, No, I think it's not the language problem, it's more the design of the SDK. Yes? Could you talk a little bit about how you manage stateful application services like a database and this kind of stuff? Well, the the how all the so I, how I can try to explain it is is this part of the code here. So because my code is so let's say let's say this web server would be some stateful service that needs a special data migration something to happen when I'm upgrading it, right? Or needs a backup before I upgrade it, for example. Well, the operator patterns answer to that is just that this is general purpose code. You can do whatever the hell you want in there. That's all. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't really help you, but I can, I can write an if statement here, and I can do my pod restart thing here because of this is code where I can put more things in and uh, you know, do things that I want. With, uh, which, is, which sounds weird, but you can't do this with Terraform, for example, because it's expecting to be out of the box, just do things for you as it's designed and not ready for you to like extend it in millions of little places. So it's, uh, well, this is code, so you get to write things in a more difficult way, but then you also have a place to put in your own uh, logic. For example, we had a very hard time with, um, we were provisioning feature environments with basically Jenkins jobs so when somebody created a branch in their source repo, then we spun up a whole Kubernetes environment for them. And how do you clean up those environments? So we practically had to write a, because Jenkins just doesn't react on branches disappearing. So that was not an option to clean them up. So we actually had to write a special service that was running on Kubernetes, monitoring all the feature environments. And if the branch didn't exist in Bitbucket anymore, then delete them and so on. If we would have used an operator in the first place to create those environments, that operator is constantly running, it's already there, so you can just stick some extra code in there to also check for deleting those environments. So this is, the, it's, it's flexible, which comes with all kinds of downsides, but it also allows you to do fancy things. Yeah, so, so you would say, uh, if you want to properly manage your stuff in your services, then you've got to write, understand the services, what they yes. can do, and then you've got to write Yes. Code. Yes. Yeah, and hopefully if you're like just managing MySQL and there is already an operator for it. And, uh, hopefully it works well and all that, yeah. All right, if there are no more questions, then thank you very much. I hope it was uh, useful. <laughs>